Hey everybody, uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about glaze and uh, to my opinion I think it's about the most intricate part of the whole system of ceramics. The glaze can influence so much of what you're doing and it's such a broad area that most of you who are working with us here at West Valley will probably have to work with us a couple semesters before you really start understanding the different glazes. We do have a lot of glazes here for everyone. We use under glazes and normal glazes. We use over glazes and we do raku and stoneware firing. So we're doing a lot of different types of glaze techniques. And uh, there's so many different combinations of these glazes that you can use that it can get to the point where it boggles your mind. So uh, one of the hopefully good things about a demonstration that's on videotape is that you'll be able to look at it if you want to over in the library and refresh your memory before you go in to glaze uh, three or four pots at one time if you're not very familiar with what we're doing here. Okay, um, one of the things that uh, I'd like to talk to you before we get right into glaze is uh, this product right here, which is called XL Plus, and it's a ceramic glue that we use when we break a pot. Say, for instance, if this got broken off this piece right here, I could take a little bit of the glue put it around here, put it on there, and put the glaze on and fire it, and it would work out probably all right because this is a vertical piece, gravity would want to hold it in place. But say for instance, if I had an appendage, and uh, I do have one on this piece right here, like this spot right here, if you put in a, the glue underneath this, if it had fallen off, and then fired it, then gravity would want to pull it off the piece during the fire because the clay goes up to the plastics, uh, goes up to 2300 degrees. And uh, it goes back to the plastic state, just like when you got it out of the bag. So it wants to sag, it wants to give. Okay, the XL is one of the products that we use here at West Valley for gluing things back together. Another one is the sodium silicate, which is a thinner solution of this product, basically. The uh, sodium silicate, you can get into very minute uh, cracks, while this, which has clay body mixed into it, porcelain, won't get into the minute little cracks. So it's uh, a toss-up of which one you want to use on some pots that have a practice in between those areas and if there's ever any question in your mind then come and talk to me and I'll try to help you make a decision on which product to use. Okay, I want to talk to you for a couple minutes about the different types of reactions that clay bodies can have when you're working with them because some glazes make dramatic changes in their color relationships depending on how they're fired. And uh, I want to show you a couple examples right here. This particular color that you see right here, this green-brown, which is generally called celadon, and this is a celadon type glaze, a crackle celadon, is the exact same glaze that I have on this pot here that I was just talking to you a couple minutes ago exact same glaze so that you get a red in a high reduction firing and the uh, celadon green brown in a low reduction or oxidation firing now what that really means is simply this when we're firing it in the stoneware kiln during the firing towards the end we can cut back on the oxygen and what that does is it causes the fire not to burn clean so that the 
gas that's in the kiln can't get enough oxygen to actually burn the way that it wants to. So it starts taking the oxygen out of the pot and out of the clay body. And uh, it changes the color of the clay, especially if there's iron in the clay. And uh, it changes the color of this copper glaze. This, the coloring in this glaze is copper. And that's what will turn green in oxidation and red in reduction. Now we have a similar effect that we get in our Raku firings. And I want to show you these right over here. This particular pot here has a glaze on it that we use quite often here at West Valley. This is called lithium with copper. And uh, what this glaze does is when it's in an oxidation firing and we simply take it out of the firing and you could set it on the ground or put it in an empty garbage can and let it cool slowly and it would simply turn this color. However, if you take the same pot or another pot like this one here, what we did here is we fired the pot in the kiln, then we took a garbage can, we lined it with newspaper, and we took it out of the kiln at a, a certain temperature after it had glossed over. The glaze will puff up a little bit, then it will gloss back down and get a kind of like a a red brilliant cherry color and then you grab it out of the kiln put it into the garbage can full of newspaper let it flame up put the lid on and then it does exactly the same thing that we had done in the stonework kiln it sucks the oxygen out of the clay body out of the glaze and changes the green color to this copper color and it can get quite elaborate that particular glaze and another one called oil luster that we use here is on this pot here too, which has gone into reduction. And it's got kind of like a yellow gold color here, has copper color here, it's got a bluish color and a purple color. It goes in a lot of different directions and you really can't be sure exactly what you're gonna get with this particular glaze. But it's exciting, a lot of people like to work with it, including myself. And uh, so it's something that all of you should try. Okay, I'm gonna move a couple of these away so I can talk to you about a couple other things here. Okay, what I want to talk to you now about now is underglaze. And the underglaze that we use here comes in these little jars. It's a commercial product that we buy from Western Ceramics. And uh, the reason we buy it rather than make it up is this. If we had to make up all the separate colors that we're able to purchase at uh, Western and then try to keep them on hand all the time it would just be an overpowering kind of thing. We don't have enough help here so we can't do it. So we do use these commercial underglazes. So I want to show you a couple examples of how these have been used. This little pot made by a student here has underglazes on it and uh, the yellow, the blue, greens, browns. We have just about all the different colors you could expect. One thing I want to warn you about is the reds, if you fire them in a stoneware firing, can burn out, which means that they'll turn white because when they go up to a real high temperature, the colorant that's used in this is a colorant that will burn out. So, Watch out if you're gonna use red on this, and yellows will sometimes burn out if there's a heavy reduction. Now, when you put this glaze on, the 
company, the manufacturer, recommends that you put three to five coats. And they recommend that if you put your first coat on brushing it this way, then you should put the second coat on brushing it that way. However, it will also come down to a matter of taste. You may want to have a color that fades out. And uh, if you're doing that, obviously you can't put three coats or five coats all over. You can spray it on and have it fade out. Okay, now after you've put that particular underglaze on, different colors, what you have to do is then put an overglaze on top of it. Now, generally what people want to put on is a transparent glaze, and this is what's on this particular student pot here. They've put a, sprayed a transparent glaze over all the underglazes, and as you can see, it gives it a glossy appearance. And if you look at those together, you'll see that this one that doesn't have overglaze on it is matte colored, doesn't have any shine to it. This one does have shine because it's got the overglaze on it. Okay, here's another example of underglaze. This particular uh, face pot, this orange color that you see right here is not the color of the pot. It's an orange underglaze that was sprayed on. The eyes, which are white, this is an underglaze that was brushed on. And then after it was finished, an overglaze was sprayed over the, other, the uh, underglazes. And if you look at the back side of the pie, you can see the real color of the clay body. This is the color of the clay body here, but this is what the kinds of effects you can get. And as you can see, it's faded out here. And the faded out area was done by just spraying and then letting it get lighter application here as you have over here. Okay. about is general types of application of glaze. And what I have for you and is a handout that you can put in your notebook so it can kind of remind you of the basic techniques and what you're supposed to do before you start putting the glazes on. So I'm just going to quickly read through this. How to prepare your ceramics for receiving glaze. Wash off the surface of the form with a large wet sponge. Okay, this is extremely important. And uh, I'll explain to you right now why. When you're letting a pot sit around in a ceramic studio, especially a studio like this one, where lots and lots of people are going through all the time, you have a lot of dust kicked up and the dust settles down on the pots and uh, it can work as a release, just like you would put a soap release, a, a liquid soap release in a mold in order to make whatever material, say for instance, if you were trying to put fiberglass into the mold and then pop it out, the seal of the soap would make a separation. Well, this is the same theory here. If you put a glaze on top of a very dusty pot, what can happen is it can work as a release and then you'll have sometimes what's called crawling where you could get a bare spot on the, on the pot where the glaze has just kind of spread out and gone away from the surface of the pot and leaves a big bare spot. Okay, I'm just gonna give you an extreme example here. This pot has a lot of dust on it. I don't know if you can see this on the video, but there, it, there's a lot of dust there. So we wanna wipe off this pot. 
And there's another reason why we want you to wipe off your pot. And that's because the glazes, if everything is the way we hope it is supposed to be, the glazes are made to a consistency that is supposed to be put on a pot that's been wiped with a wet sponge. Because uh, the thickness of the glaze in the vat is very important. If it's too thick, then you can get too much glaze on and it can cause the glaze to crack. And if you ever have a glaze where you put the glaze on and then it looks real thick and chunky and then as it starts drying, it'll form cracks on it like drying mud. I'm sure you've seen mud where it dries out and then kind of curls up on the edges of the cracks. That's the same effect that you would have on a uh, pot. All right, now we try to get people to put signatures on their pots when they make them. You can put it on by just taking a little stick and writing your initial on the bottom. But if you do forget, there is a way that you can remedy the problem at this stage, and that's by taking some cobalt oxide, and this is oxide right here, and you can put your initial on, Whoa, this is really weak, I'm going to have to do that again, let me stir this up some more here. Okay, so now we have uh, some cobalt oxide on the bottom of our pot with a signature, and uh, if you wanted to, you could also put a date on there. And what I have right down here is a hot plate and I have inside the hot plate paraffin that has been melted to a degree where when I set this pot in it I can get a wax coat on the bottom. That's what I'm going to do right now. All right, now in this particular case, a little bit of air stayed in here and didn't let the wax touch it. So we have another type of wax that I have right here that is in a liquid state. And uh, this is kept in the glazing room for you all the time. You just simply wipe this type on and it does the same thing as the other one, but the hot wax is easier to handle for this type of technique. And it doesn't run. Okay, now also in that same jars, we have a larger brush. Now the larger brush is to get a different type of effect actually a design effect on a pot a wax resist design and what wax resist does is this when you put it on the pot 
Of course, it seals it so as the glaze can't stick to it. And you can get a design working for you in that type of manner. And I'll just show you. You can just make something like that. And you got a area now that when you put the glaze on, that particular area won't have any glaze and the clay body will show through. Now, one of the things that you can do too with this wax resist is I could put one glaze on the pot, then put the wax resist on top of that glaze, same manner, put another glaze on, and then we'd have the glazes mixing where the two glazes are together and where the wax resist is, you'd have the first glaze only. All right, one of the things that we mentioned on our handout here is wax resist should always be used between a lid and the jar. So we have a lid here, we have the jar there, and uh, if we don't put the wax resist in areas of contact where the two contact, what we will have is we'll have one solid sculpture. We won't, <laughs> we won't have any more pot, it'll be a sculpture. All right, now I wanna show you how to do this because there are there is a trick. And the trick is simply this. If you take your brush full of wax and bring it over the pot, so say for instance, I was gonna hold it like this and then come down and put the wax resist on this way, there's a good chance that you could get a drip of wax where you don't want it. And especially on a form, maybe in an area like this, right here on the edge of a pot and you don't want it there and then you're stuck with it. So what I do is I ask everyone to hold it kind of upside down like this. Come around. In this case, because it's a lid, it's right side up. Put the wax resist on. Yeah, I think you did see that little drip that came down there. That's one of the things that happens with this. And you said you got to be real careful. And you want to make sure that you touch the areas where the contact between the two is going to be. Okay, so I want to do the same thing on this pot here. Okay, now on this one, because it's a drop lid, I'm also going to try to get some wax on the inside. And I couldn't do that, of course, because I had my hand on the inside. On my first attempt, so what I want to do is I want to get some on the inside. Because anywhere they make contact and there's little droplets of glaze, you are stuck with it. Now this particular wax technique, you may have to dab it dry because it can take a long time to dry because it isn't hot wax. And that's one of the advantages of the hot wax is it dries immediately and you can start glazing immediately. Now there's lots and lots of glazes that we have here, but for containers like this particular form, I 
I recommend that you put one of the Majelica colors on the inside. Now Majelica, we have Majelica white, Majelica blue, and Majelica green. And the reason I recommend that people put that particular glaze on the inside, or glazes, is that number one, they're light glazes, they're real not, they're not very dark, so that once the glaze is there, you can, if you've got uh, food in it, you can see the food is stuck to the wall and you can wash it off. And if you want to sell your products, a lot of people really want a white interior because they feel that uh, they can see the dirt. Also, it's very glossy. It always gets a very nice glossy shine to it which means that you can clean it easily. It isn't a matte glaze. It has little tiny uh, pit holes in it. And also, it's, these glazes don't blister. Now, if you put a glaze on the inside of a pot that had a lot of iron oxide in it, there's a good chance that you would have a very uh, blistery interior. You have big bubbles inside of glaze and Basically, you've ruined the pot. It really isn't worth anything after that. You just have to chuck it, throw it away. Alrighty. I want to talk to you now about the way you apply your glaze. We have these basins here for you, and we advise everyone to Pour your glazes over one of these basins. They're wider than the vats that the glaze come in so that uh, your spillage is cut down. You won't be spilling as much as you might if you were trying to pour it back into a smaller container. Okay, I'm going to uh, recommend to you now that whenever you're working with any of our glazes here, that you have to keep something in mind. These glazes are made out of chemicals, some of which are very heavy and want to settle to the bottom of the tank. So, you should always mix your glaze ahead of time. Okay. Now I generally use my hands for mixing glazes because I can feel the glaze and feel the thickness. And that way I know uh, basically what I'm getting here. Now the way that I gauge the thickness of the glaze is this. This is the way I was taught to do it when I uh, was the student back at Eastern Michigan University, and that is, is you dip your hand into the glaze, and if you can just barely start to see your fingerprints coming through, then the glaze is a good state for apply, application. If it's kind of heavy and chunky, and in this case, this one has some heavy glaze in it, and you can dunk your hands in and see how my fingers get thick and heavy, that's too heavy. Okay, so the next glaze over here, which is one of our more popular glazes called XB Blue. By the way, you don't have to use your hand to mix the glazes. We have sticks, stirring spoons in the other room, in the glaze room for you, you can stir them. It's just that I prefer to do it this way because I can feel the texture of the glaze, as I mentioned. But if you do do this, you should keep a bottle of Jurgen's lotion around because this stuff will dry out your hands pretty quick. Oh, 
Okay. Okay, that one's getting close. Now I'm going to mix up another glaze I'm going to use in that pot. This is the Majelka White, the one I was talking to you about a minute ago. Okay, I had two porn pictures, but I can find one now. Okay, now one of the things you're going to have to be doing all the time is washing your hands and wiping them off because you don't want to handle the pots with wet hands because it'll take the glaze off a pot that's already been glazed and it'll also get too much moisture in certain spots on the pot if it hasn't got glaze on it already. Now, I'm going to put the Majelica White on the inside of the pot and I'm going to do that first. And I'll explain to you why in just a second. So I just pour the glaze in. And then turn it and start pouring it out, like so. Now I put the glaze on the inside first. And the reason is this, as you saw me turn the pot in my hands to let the pour, it pour all the way around through the pot, on the inside, I had to handle the outside of the pot. Now, if I had glazed the outside already and I started handling that with the glaze on, then I'd start smearing all the different effects that I had. I mean, maybe you might want that effect, but most people don't. They want to have a little more control than that. Okay, so now I've got that interior done. And just a second before I take that away, I want to do the interior of the lid also. So. Okay, now I've, I've got the interior of the lid and I've got the interior of the pot. And on when I poured the glaze out of the inside, little droplets of glaze now are sitting on top of the wax resist right along here. So very important, you wanna wipe them off either with a paper towel or a sponge. And I'll have to do it again after I put the glaze on the outside because you could end up with little droplets there and you think you've taken care of your problem by putting the wax resist on but if the droplets are on top of the wax resist you put your lid on then it's fired those little droplets will seal it to the pot so again you gotta be very careful you have to do the same thing with the bottom down here you always check your bottoms and where your lids go to make sure there's no droplets of glaze okay now this is drying the inside already because these things dry quite quickly. So now I can move on to my next glaze. And the next one I'm going to use is going to be the XP Blue. And uh, there's a couple reasons I want to use this particular glaze for you. One, most people like it, and most people will use it at least once on one of their pieces during the semester. And also because it can be one of the more tricky glazes to use. And by that, I mean that if you get it on a little too heavy, it tends to run. Now, 
that can be very, very dangerous because if you have a pot, you've done everything, you've worked all this time trying to throw a pot, it's nice and big and everything, and then you do your glazing application, it's gone through the bisque firing and all this, and then you glaze it, you get too much glaze on it, it sticks to the shell, when you break it, taking it off, you've lost your pot. So, be careful. Make sure that if you put the glaze all the way down towards the bottom of the pot, that you get your wax resist so that it's a minimum of a quarter inch from the bottom edge. And now, some people don't like this. They don't like to have a bare piece of clay at the bottom of their pot. But when you're starting out in ceramics, generally you're going to get the glazes on too thick once in a while. It just happens. Very few people don't. So remember, one quarter of an inch from the bottom of the pot up the side. Okay, now I'm going to hold this over the pot and I twist my hand around. I'm not letting my fingernails touch the interior of the pot because they can scratch the glaze off. So now I'm going to start pouring and at the same time I can move the pot around Okay, now even with the basin being as big as it was, some of it spilled out because it's a fairly big form. Okay, now I got a couple areas there where the glaze didn't coat all the way. And interestingly enough, it was where the wax resist was, and probably the wax resist just forced the clay to go off to the side. And uh, I'm gonna put another coat of glaze over the, the area here going this direction and just leave one coat at the bottom. Now generally this particular glaze will turn to a light brown where it's thin and it'll go into a blue color where it's thick. So that's what I intend to do with it. Okay, I'll pour this back in here. And so now I'll make my second pour. Okay, now right around the bottom here, I got a few areas where I got a little too little glaze or the glaze didn't get on there. So I can just take my finger or take a small brush and just touch it up a little bit and then it'll be pretty close to normal. Now, for instance, if you put the glaze on and for one reason or other you change your mind, you could wash the glaze off, let it dry for a day, come back and do it again. And uh, then you have a second glaze attempt. And once in a while you do do that. Another thing that can happen is after you've fired the pot and it comes out and you don't like it, doesn't look like what you expected it to look like and you'll have quite a few of those because uh, most people when they're first starting out can't accept the fact that the pot doesn't look exactly the way they expected it to look, but oftentimes it won't. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit of wax resist on the lid of this. 
So it'll kind of go along with the uh, wax resist design that we have there. On the pot form. And now I just pour my glaze over here. Okay. Now the wax resist held a little bit of wax, uh, the glaze right here, so I'll have to wipe it a little bit more after it's dry. Now I'm going to put on a little bit more so I have the change in color like the bottom piece also has. Because as I said, this glaze will be light brown where it's thin and it will be blue where it's thicker. for a second more. So now I'll get some more of these little droplets off this area. Now there's little droplets on the wax resist here. It's up to you if you want to leave them. Some people would like to have them still there. Some people may not. So you can take them off or leave them in. Totally up to you. Wash out my basins. And my hands. these basins I want to mention to you one of the problems that we can have happen around here is that people will pour their glazes set the basin down take their pot put it on the glazing shelf for the technician to take away to be glazed and then they just leave the basin there and we'll have our basin half filled with glaze and the people who come in next won't know what glaze it was and so it'll have to be tossed out so whatever you do always try to remember that you want to clean out the basin and put the glaze excess glaze back into the vat that you got it from. Okay, now, what I have here are two little forms. This one is a student form of a little old witch or a little old hag. 
And instead of putting a glaze on here, they put it on what is called a stain. This is red iron stain. And when it's applied lightly, it goes to a light brown. As it gets heavier applied, then it goes to kind of a metallic blue. And then when it gets a real heavy dose, then it almost looks like it's got uh, gunmetal quality to it, kind of a dark blue gunmetal quality. This one here, this is another stain. This is our cobalt stain. And this one is probably the most potent colorant we use here. And it comes out for brilliant blues with light applications in a glaze. In this particular case, it's just water and cobalt. And uh, you put it on, put it in the kiln, fire it, and it comes out, it looks like this. It looks almost like cast iron. It's an interesting effect. And you can combine those effects on your pots too. You don't have to have just a cobalt oxide pot. You can have part of the pot as cobalt oxide, part of the pot as regular glaze. Okay, now I want to show you another technique in glazing, a very basic, simple technique. And I've already got this one kind of going on this particular pot. And uh, I'm going to use this pot to show you how you do two more techniques. One is called dipping and one is called banding. So, right here, this circle that you see on the pot is actually a dip. And I'm going to show you how we do that right here with this particular glaze. I'm going to dip it again. And uh, I'm actually going to have the one dip overlap another dip. So we'll have two circles. You got to be kind of careful because you can get to the dip in a spot that you really don't want it. Now uh, here's a good example of what I mentioned just a minute ago, where it's very important to mix your glazes before you stick the pot into it because as you can see there's little feathered edges here where I dipped it and that's because the glaze had started to settle a little bit already. So I'm just going to stir it up a little bit again in here for our next dip and see if that will come out a little better. I mean, sometimes an accident like that can be very nice. So it might work out that you like it that way. But uh, this one didn't because I stirred it up and it got a very hard edge to it. So you can see that. But one of the things that when you're dipping that's important is, is when you dip it down into the glaze, hold it this way for a certain amount of time until you can see that the glaze is actually drying. If you take it out and hold it like this real quick or hold it like that, you could get a run that will run down the side of the pot and it may not be what you're after. Okay, I'm just going to dip this uh, quickly. I'm going to rub a little bit of this glaze off and then dip it quickly see if I can get a hard edge on this one too. There we go. 
So we get a hard edge on both of them. And uh, set that down. Now I want to show you another type of dipping. This is when you're working with a smaller form like a cup. And uh, I'm going to take this little cup here and show you how we would handle that. Now you could put a signature on there and I'm not going to bother doing that. I'm just going to put it in the hot wax. Get the bottom covered and I can let it dry for a second. And I'm going to use our XB Blue again because we've already stirred that up. But I can tell just by looking at it that it started to settle already. Right. So I'm going to mix up a little bit more. And this particular tool, which is called dipping tongs or dipping pliers, is made in a special way so that when you dip it, you only have small areas of contact. If you look at that, they come to little points on the edges of these teeth-like things. And then you simply come up to the glaze, take the whole form in like this, dip it in, and then come out immediately. You don't want to hold it in there a long period of time. The longer you hold it in, the more glaze that goes onto it. And again, with a glaze like this one, XV Blue, you could have a situation where you get too much glaze, it runs, stick to the shelf, and then you're stuck with it. Okay, because it is XV Blue, and it's fairly thin, because we keep it thin because it runs, I'm going to dip it one more time, but only about two-thirds of the way down so that it will have a change in color. But first, I'm trying to let it dry out fairly well. You don't want to dip it while it's still wet. Looks pretty dry now, so I'm dip it a second time. Then you want to check the bottom, make sure there's nothing on it. And you can take it over, put it on the glaze shelf, and uh, it'll be fired for you. Okay, now one of the things that can be done, can happen when you're using tongs, and even when you're not using tongs, is you can get little pits in the glaze. And uh, this one is forming some little pits. So, uh, what we do with those little pits is this. You wait till the glaze has dried, and obviously it's not dry yet, but it will be in a couple minutes. Then you just take your finger and rub it, and the glaze will rub from the high points into the little pits, and it'll fill it all in, and so you won't have any chance of the glaze pitting because of that particular reason. It could pit for another reason, <coughs> but not for the fact that you already had a pit in the glaze from the glazing application. The other reason it could pit is simply this. One of the things that happens is some of the glazes, especially when the kiln goes into reduction, will bubble up. The bubbles will burst, and if they don't go all the way down again, then it'll leave a little pit there. So that can happen. All right, now I'm going to take this sponge and clean up this piece here where the wax resist was. And you can see, simply by taking the wet sponge and rubbing it, the glaze wants to come off the area that um, has the wax resist on it. And where the glaze is stuck to the pot, it wants to stay there. So here I am, my wax is just working for me there. And 
And again, I'm going to look on the inside of this. I'm going to wipe all the glazed droplets that I can find in any area of contact or even near the area of contact because the glazes can move. They can even go up sometimes, strangely enough. Make contact and seal your lid. Okay, I'm going to break for a second. I'll come back to you and I'll show you a couple other ways of applying glazes off of throwing wheel. So we'll be back in just a second. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is show you a couple techniques that are done off the wheel. And one of the techniques I'm going to be showing you is called trailing. Now this little pot here was done with a trailing technique where I took the glaze and squirted it on the wheel on the pot while it was on the wheel, and then it drips down to the edges and then flies off at uh, one point. And that's what gives you those kind of regular drips. This is straight on the pot. And I have another one here. This one was using two glazes where I took our black Albany slip glaze and then I took the Majelica white, centered it on the wheel, got the wheel spinning, and then squirted the uh, second glaze on with a special squirter and I'll show you that right here what I have is a wellum balsam squirt bottle and uh, I'm going to take my glaze I've already stirred it up put it in this container with a funnel at the end, and then I'll pour the glaze in here. Now we put the lid on, and now we're about ready to go. But before I uh, go ahead with this, what I want to do is I want to just talk to you a minute about this technique. About 50% of the time that people will use this technique, they will leave the glaze in the balsam bottle. Just about every time I go to pick up this bottle, it's half full of glaze because people use it, they forget to put the glaze back into the container, and here we are stuck with, again, glazes. We don't know what they are, so we have to toss them out. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this wheel going a little faster. I've already kind of centered it on the wheel pot and I'm going to come in like so and squirt it I'm going to slow it down a little bit so you can see those regular kind of strokes that you get with that technique and uh, now by taking the same glaze, I'm going to also put some glaze up at the top. Now the first technique that I showed you was called trailing, where you just squirt it out of some type of container and then let it trail down. This one is called banding. I've got the glaze on a brush and I come in like so and just apply it to the rim. Okay, so we can get a uh, ring around a piece and at the same time uh, get this kind of striped effect using the wheel. It's going to 
touch it up there in one little spot. It didn't seem to get it quite as much glaze. Okay, so those are two techniques, banding and trimming. I want to talk to you uh, now about uh, another method of glazing. And uh, if you take a look at this little Volkswagen here, we have a technique which is called overglazing. I showed you underglazing, where you took a MAC kind of clay like body, put it on the pottery. It has color, but it doesn't have any gloss to it, no glassy quality. But you spray or dip or pour another glaze on top of the underglaze and you get a, a glossy surface. Now, say for instance if that happened and you weren't happy with the result, you could go on to another glaze technique called overglazing. This is what this is right here. I keep them in a little shoe box, all the different colors. We have all the basic colors like red, yellow, blue, green, black, white, brown and they're oil-based colors. So when you use them, you're gonna to have to come back to me to get some paint thinner to clean your brushes after you're finished. And I'm also gonna ask you to bring the piece to me so I can put it in the kiln room, in a special area that we have for overglazing, and then we'll fire the overglaze. Now, this is the yellow that's on this area right here. This is the green that's going across here, and then the black. But up here, you'll see that there's a metallic quality to this area here, to the light areas here. And what that is, is it's a different type of overglaze that has to be fired at a really low temperature. And we fire our overglazes at somewhere around cone 018. I want to show you a bottle right here. This little tiny bottle here is a metallic overglaze. This particular one is platinum. You can get them in gold, you can get them in silver and the platinum and bronze, copper. And then you paint them on your piece on top of a glaze that has already been fired. So you've got your glaze on there already. You can put a base glaze on, just a pure white, Majelica white or something like that, and then paint the gold, paint the yellow, paint the green, or whatever colors you want. Then, as I said, you let me have it, I put it in the back room, we fire it for you, and then you can come out with something like this, where you have metallic qualities like this light silver here. I don't know if you can see the color in this, but this is actually a golden color right back here. And uh, you can get some really beautiful effects using these techniques. Now I want to show you another technique which uh, a lot of people like very much, and that's using a spray gun. But when you use a spray gun, uh, you're, you're going to have to go through a couple steps that uh, I think are absolutely necessary. And I'm just going to show you right here what they are. What I have here is I have a screen inside this metal loop and uh, what we do is we take our glaze put it in a basin like this then we pour our glaze in And I run it through this, this screen. And uh, I think the reason is pretty obvious. If there's any chunks of uh, little pieces of bisqueware in there or any kind of little alien element that someone has dropped into the glaze, the screen takes it out. Because when you're spraying through a spray gun, if you plug up your gun with little chips of whatever's in there, it really makes it a lot tougher. So that's why we do that. I recommend that you get water on your screen as quickly as possible and wash it out. 
because if you let it sit around, the screen can be like probably maybe 50 times harder to wash if you let the glaze dry. Okay, now that we've got our glaze, then I take this little container that I'm going to attach to the spray gun, and I'm going to pour some glaze into it. Now I'm not going to fill it all the way to the top because all the glazes that we have mixed back here are not mixed to spraying consistency. They're mixed to pouring, dipping consistencies. So what we want to do generally is just add a little bit more water and then shake it up good. You may have to uh, even do it a second time if you didn't get enough water the first time because if you go to the spray booth and start spraying and the glaze won't come out or it comes out kind of spurty like and not really a nice even flow. But generally what it means is the glaze is too thick. If it continues to have trouble squirting through, then I'd recommend you bring the gun in to me and let me look at it and see if there's something wrong with the gun. Sometimes the guns will just be worn out or plugged up or not uh, put together correctly in order to spray adequately. Okay, so now we just take this, put it onto our spray gun. And I want to show you right here, one of the things that can happen with this particular type of spray gun, which I think is a very good type of spray gun, this is a spray gun that's made by Pache, which makes airbrushes. And the theory of this is the air blows through this section of the gun, goes over the top of this tube, and sucks the glaze out of the bottom here so that you don't have any glaze running through this part of the gun, this area right in here. It only goes through this one little tube. So you don't have to worry about this part of the gun breaking down. We used to use guns where the glaze went through this part and they break down about every six weeks. It became very expensive to try to keep them operating. So this gun works a lot better. Okay, now, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go outside and uh, I'll show you the spray booth and how to set it up. But before I do that, I just want to talk to you about one more technique that you can use and that I intend to use on this particular piece right here. This piece has a hollow lid handle and because of that, what I can do is I can take glass and put broken pieces of glass in here. You can choose the color depending on where you get the glass. <clears throat> if you wanted to get really elaborate, you could even get stained glass and break it up and put it in here. You put it on inside there and you fire it normally, and then you'll have this pool of glass inside, which looks very nice. And I keep a little box of glass in my cabinet all the time, so if you want to use some, feel free to ask for some. Okay? So now uh, we'll see you in a couple minutes when we get outside with the spray booth. Okay, here we are now. This is our spray booth, and uh, we're in the process of having instructions put on the side here, and uh, hopefully they'll be ready for you when you're using this. Because it isn't always easy to remember things uh, when you see it one week and you want to glaze it the next week. Anyway, one of the uh, things that frustrates a lot of people is this little apparatus here. Now, in order to get this uh, nipple inside, what you have to do is you have to push back on this green and yellow striped area. Stick this in and let it come back. And now your spray hose is attached. Okay, now, here we are again with our gun. What we ask everyone to do when they're working with these guns is to hang them here. That's what this is for. Now, what a lot of people like to do is take the gun, set it down, and put it right here. And as you can see, you saw it tip a little bit already. Well, as the gun sprays out and you have less and less liquid inside, then it could tend to fall, fall off onto the floor, and then you get your gun all banged up. So that's the main reason we want you to hang your gun up here. Now, the top 
switch here is a light. Turn the light on. The second one is a fan. And if you look back here, you can see that we have these filters in here. And the fans go on, suck most of the crud into those filters, and that's the way we hopefully keep it fairly clean around here. And uh, the bottom one is the compressor switch. <clears throat> in the bottom of the spray booth, we have a compressor. And uh, one of the personality traits that this particular uh, compressor has is when <clears throat> the tank is full of compressed air, it'll start to make a whining sound. So if you hear that whining sound, I'm sure you will if you leave the compressor going, all you have to do is switch the compressor off again, keep spraying until you see your spray start to get less and less coming out of the gun, then you just switch it on again. So uh, those are the little personality traits that this thing has. And what I'm holding here is a little face mask. We have face masks for you in the art lab uh, tool room, and you should always get a face mask when you're going to spray with uh, our spray equipment, obviously, because you don't want to breathe it in. The fans can't draw it all out. You will breathe some of it in, and you don't want to be breathing all the weird chemicals that are in the glazes into your lung. Okay, so I'm going to put that mask on now, and it has a little piece of metal right at the top that you can press to get the contour of your nose and that way you won't have the tendency for the spray to come in through this area here. Alright, now what I've done and I recommend everyone to do is take a little piece of paper towel, put it on top of the pedestal here, it helps keep it clean, and then you can take your pot, set it down on here, and uh, you want to get it fairly well centered because strangely enough, if it isn't, the distance, say if the pot is a little closer on one side, like it will come out this side here and then it's further away from the spray gun on the other side, you'll get more spray on the side closest. So you want to keep it centered when you're spraying. Okay, so now I'm going to turn our fan and turn on the compressor. It's going to be harder for you to hear me, so I'm going to try to speak up now. I have to let the compressor run for a couple minutes to build up pressure. And uh, this little gauge here tells us about how much pressure we are going to be using. We have a bolt in the top that regulates the pressure. We keep it at one pressure all the time because uh, we just uh, don't feel there's any reason to change it. As far as you're concerned, there's no reason to change. Okay, now another thing that's very important when you're using this particular gun is you make sure that the bottom tube right here is directly in front of this tube as it sprays out. It can be turned to the side like that, and if it turns to the side like that, then you won't get as much spray or you won't get none at all, so that's very important. Another thing that's important is always make sure that this screw up at the top is screwed in tight, otherwise this area can slip off and the whole canister would fall. Alright, now when we start spraying this piece of pottery, one of the things that I recommend to you is this. When you start spraying, start spraying off the side. Don't point your gun right at the pottery when you start the gun. Start it and then move on to it. If you're pointing the gun directly at it, you have a good chance you'll get a splotch where you start spraying. You get one big blotch and it'll be, have more glaze in that spot than any other place. I'm going to tear off some of the edges on this paper towel because sometimes the paper towel can fly up like this and get in the way of the spray. So. If I can avoid that right off, make it better for us. Okay, now we're up to about 20, 25 pounds right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shake this up a little bit because whenever you 
are sitting around and you let the glaze set for a while, it'll tend to settle and then you'll have thicker glaze at the bottom than you will have at the top. So, okay, I think we're about ready. Okay, now I may have had this sit long enough that the glaze has now settled and went to the bottom, and that's the reason it's not coming out. So I'm going to run into the uh, lab and thin out a little bit of the paper. turnstile like this, as I said, I'll start spraying off to the side and then move on.
Okay, I just want to talk for a minute here. I found that in the uh, when you're working with a fairly large piece like this one, that you can spray all the way down to the bottom, and by the time you get to the bottom, then the top is dry again. So you can keep spraying it because the bigger pots absorb the moisture the most. But if you're working with a small form and it's a tiny thing and you start spraying and you get too much glaze on, you have a chance of it running down and then causing drips on, on the form. And a lot of the glazes are funny. If you have a thicker coat of glaze, it may turn the glaze lighter. Some glazes may turn darker with a thicker coat of glaze. And XB Blue will actually go from a light brown to a dark blue and then back to a light blue. All one glaze, but just depending on the thickness. So if you want to get a nice even coat, then you want to spray up and down a few times. Maybe spray seven or eight thin coats rather than trying to get one heavy coat. Because one heavy coat will cause you more trouble than it's worth. Okay, one of the things that everyone is concerned about is how thick you spray your glaze on. And uh, like most things in this kind of a situation, it is relative to a certain degree. But what I think is a, a good thickness for most glazes is if you think of the thickness that a, the lead in a pencil is, not the wooden part, but the lead part, about one sixteenth of an inch to an eighth of an inch, depending on the glaze and how close you are to the glaze when you're spraying. Now, if you spray up very, very close, you'll get a smooth surface to your glaze, but if you spray from a distance the way I was doing, you'll start to get a pebbly kind of sandpaper looking surface, which I'm starting to get right in this area right here now. And as I continue to spray, it'll go all the way around. So, uh, here we go again.
Okay, uh, just a couple more things I want to mention to you. Whenever you're glazing any pie, whether you're spraying or dipping or pouring or whatever, always remember that you have to have less glaze near the bottom of the pot than you do at the tops of the pot. Because when you're spraying the glaze on here, I try to get a little less glaze down near the bottom because when the glaze starts to run during the firing, if you have a very thick layer at the bottom, then it runs automatically and sticks to the shell. Same thing if you're going to be pouring or dipping. Maybe your first pour should be the whole pot. The second pour should be two-thirds down from the top of the pot. If you want to put on a third color, then maybe make that one up on the top one-third of the pot. So that's very important. And again, now that I've got my glaze sprayed on, I'm going to come back with a sponge and clean up around the lips to make sure there's no glaze on the lip where the lid meets the, the shelf of the pot. And I'm also going to clean up the bottom of the pot, get all the excess glaze off the bottom so there's no chance it will stick to the shelves later on in firing. Okay, one more thing is we don't want anyone using the gun as a game thing and start spraying people in the face or spraying in their ears and things because these chemicals can be dangerous and that's why we wear the mask. So uh, make sure that you don't use it as a fun tool. And then always clean the gun. Empty the tank back into the original vat of glaze. Wash it out with water. Come back up here. Spray water through the gun. Then bring it back to either the lab or to myself, depending on whose gun you're using. Okay, so thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you later.